Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Comic-Con version 3. Uh, please uh, feel free to get seated. We're going to get started with the presentations here in a second. You know, Comma's been around for basically 10 years now. Every year, we have better products, we make better software, we're growing, we sell more, and we have more Comic-Cons, and there's more of you every time. This is Comic-Con version 3, and I think you guys are really going to enjoy the stuff we're going to talk about and some of the cool new things that we're going to be able to show. Um, there are some cool booths around that you guys can explore uh, in, the, in the free moments. Uh, to get started, we're going to start with a presentation from the OpenPilot team about uh, OpenPilot development. And uh, they're going to come up right now, Shane and Maxime from the OpenPilot team. We'll start with their presentation on solving simplicity for OpenPilot development. Enjoy. All right, so today I want to talk to you about two core principles that we use to develop OpenPilot. The first one is testing or requirements. And the second one is simplicity. And then I will show you how those two things actually go full circle at some point, which is very cool. So let's start with the first one, testing and requirements. You need them. And in order, well, whoop, yeah, nice clicker. Um, so we believe that your test should be as quick as possible in order to iterate as fast as possible without fearing regression from the past. And in order to do this, we did a project called the One Minute CI, which as the name states, your whole CI must complete in one minute, otherwise it fails. And this is very important because we consider that the time it takes to test your code should be part of the test itself. Your code should be fast and quick to test. And we use GitHub Actions for most of our CI on OpenPilot. And I took the screenshot from our GitHub page this morning. And as you can see, everything runs in one minute. And this is all the tests that we run every time you push a single commit to OpenPilot. And we do a bunch of stuff. We build a release, uh, we build a docs, uh, we test the simulator, we run unit tests, we run static analysis. Uh, we do a bunch of stuff. And if you, want do, uh, if you want to do stuff like this, if you want fast CI, which I'm sure you want, if you don't think you want it, start making your CI faster and you will learn that you don't want to go back to your garbage CI. So if you want to do this, I have a few tips for you. The first one is you should probably delete or at least reevaluate most of your tests. Because most of your tests were probably written at a time where you didn't even understood your software. And now if you reread them, you probably understand that most of them are useless. Uh, the second thing you should do is you should dream a little bit. As Harold said, this is the uh, comma 10th uh, anniversary, and about nine years ago, there's a very famous commit that was made to OpenPilot. And if I can click, nope, not this one, yes, this one. From nine years ago, that says one day we will have CI, one day we will have testing, and these days we have testing, and we have very good testing, but in the spirit of this commit, uh, about a year ago, uh, I did uh, a reply to an issue on GitHub uh, to, if I can click, thank you, that says one day OpenPilot will install in 10 seconds. You know? And what I mean by what OpenPilot will install in 10 seconds, I mean that you know, before you start testing your code, you have to install Python or your packages, maybe Valgrind or something like that, and this is a recurring cost, and you want to shrink that recurring cost as much as possible. So testing is very fast. And these days, you can install OpenPilot in around 11 seconds, you know, so off by one, but we're getting there. It used to be in the minutes, and this is insane. Now it's very fast. Um, another thing you should do is you should chase every second, because you only have 60 seconds to test your code, so every second matters. And if, you, uh, if your CI takes 17 minutes to run, you probably don't care about 10 seconds. But I'm going to show you one very specific example where we save 10 seconds with our unit test. We use PyTest for, to run our unit test because most of our code base is written in Python. And this is how we run PyTest. We run PyTest very simply, but just before that, we also run PyTest with dash dash collects only. And those two lines are 10 seconds faster to run than only running PyTest. 
because it does a bunch of stuff because we use multiprocessing to run our test. And many people didn't believe me when I pushed this commit. And they tried to revert this line because they didn't understood why it saves 10 seconds. And every time they did this, they actually had to revert with a uh, realization like this that it actually saves 10 seconds. I don't know if you can see this, but yeah, uh, Shane made this commit about a year ago. So very fun. Um, but I think quick and fast CI is not enough, right? Because I could write something like time.sleep5, it will run instantly, but it will be garbage. It won't catch anything. So you actually want to be able to you know, trust your test. And one way to do this is you should never have flaky tests. If a test fails, it should always be because the code it's testing is bad, not because the test itself is bad. And in order to do this, we did a very, very simple thing that you should actually do right now after this talk. In GitHub, Action and even Jenkins that we use for our Arduino in the loop test, they have a feature where if a test fails, you can just press a button to replay it for some reason. And you know, if you have a flaky test, maybe you have a test with a threshold, you know, and sometimes it goes a little bit over or down the threshold, and most people just play the replay button and they go on with their day. And the flaky test stays in CI forever, and they never fix it. We actually disable this feature. And on top is GitHub Actions, the bottom is Jenkins, it will yell at you, you know, don't do this, fix the test, you know, fix them instead. Uh, this is very powerful, and this way you can eliminate, you know, flaky tests, and this is very nice. Otherwise, the flaky test will just hid in your code base. The second thing uh, to gain trust in your test, and this is the most important part, because this is not enough. This is good when you have flaky tests, but if you want to actually gain trust in your test, uh, most people will use stuff like line coverage, or if you're fancy, like branch coverage. But those metrics are not enough, right? Because I could, again, write time.sleep5 and run your whole code inside a try-catch block, never fail, I would probably get 100% line coverage, but I wouldn't catch anything. Because line coverage only checks how many lines you actually run with your test. But this idea of line coverage is very nice, because this is exactly what I want. I want to make sure that all my lines are covered by my test, right? They, have the, they check if the, the line won't change. But more specifically, I want to make sure that all the semantic, the logic of the line are covered. So what I really want is something like semantic line coverage, right? And this thing exists, and it's very nice, and it's called mutation testing. And I will explain to you what mutation testing is. Very simple. Uh, let's say that in five years, you know, uh, come up pivots to a liquor store company or something, so we need a function called is adult. But don't worry, we're still open source, so someone submits a PR, or you know, someone submits a PR. And since you are the developer, you add a feature, you add a unit test, right? And this code is correct. It checks if you're an adult, if you're above 18. But this test is garbage. It clearly doesn't understand this line. It knows that something around 18 happens, so it checks above and below, but it doesn't understand this line. But we merge it. We merge it. And five months later, I do a refactor, and I push this commit, where I change the, this sign to this sign. And I merge this, because I see a big old green check mark next to my test, and I trust it, and it was very fast, so I trust it. But now, I just change the meaning of this code. It doesn't mean anymore if you're an adult above 18. Like, just 18, and that's it. You're an adult at 18, and that's it. Uh, this whole thing, this whole experience of testing your test is what mutation testing does for you on every commit. It will take all your lines, right, all your lines, it will try to mutate them, so it will take the operators, flip them, make them bitwise, take all the numbers, make them big, small, nan, null, whatever, and then it will run all your unit tests, right? Pi tests, unit tests, whatever you have. And if your tests don't fail after those mutations, this whole thing will fail, and it will say, hey, I changed this line, and your test didn't pick up on this. You know, so either this line is like dead code, remove it, or your test don't understand this line, and you could push stuff like this. So this is very nice, because this gives you trust in the things that should give you trust in your code. Because how do you gain trust in your test? You can do it with stuff like this. And we did this for uh, the Panda Safety that now lives in OpenDBC. And f mutation testing is not perfect, because when you think about it, what if the mutation you did is like computationally equivalent to the previous thing? Well, if you have the answer to this, you just won a million dollars and a, you know, a Turing Award, uh, but it works for our purpose, and it's very nice. Okay? So now you have great tests, because they are quick, and uh, you can trust them. That's nice. 
let's talk about simplicity. I'm going to take one example, very simple, that we did very recently, actually, and that you probably use every day. It's the OpenPilot UI. We rewrote the entire OpenPilot UI from scratch. We went from a uh, UI written in Qt with C++ to a UI written in Raylib in Python. Raylib is a simple, thin wrapper or around OpenGL. And you know, Shane will talk to you more about Raylib in itself. I want to talk to you more about you know, the, the graphics stack that we used to use and our new graphics stack that we use now. So, oh, well, it's, it's crap, I guess, but it says OpenPilot UI. And um, as I said, OpenPilot UI was written in Qt, right? And since we're on Linux, we need a windowing system. So we use Wayland. But the problem with Wayland is that it's more of a standard protocol, so we need an implementation. And we use Weston. But again, in the real world, Weston doesn't really know how to speak to Qt, so we use something called WL shell to communicate. Remember that name, it will come up later. And we need the rendering client, right? So we use OpenGL ES2. And OpenGL doesn't really know how to speak to your system, so we use something called EGL. And I know the order is not you know, exactly right. This is just so it's nice and flow down. Um, but at some point, we need a buffer, right, to render frame into buffers. So we use libgbm to get buffers. And to actually drive the screen, we use something called the libdrm. Yeah. And since we are on a Qualcomm chip, we use the MSM backend and the MDP5. You know, this goes on. I could go all day. I could do the full slide. I wouldn't be done with the graphics stack, right? This stack is pretty insane. And I call it the three letters acronym stack. Because everywhere you look, there's more three letters library that just pops up. You know, uh, GBM, generic buffer management, DRM, a direct rendering management, you know, MDP5, mobile display processor 5, you know, it goes on. And by the way, EGL, it doesn't mean anything. If you go on the Kronos website, which are the guys that are developing the standard, they will tell you EGL stands for ta ta ta, but ta 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 is not EGL, so who, who knows what it means, right? Yeah. yeah, so this used to be our stack. And when we first tried to move to Raylib, I went on their GitHub page because they have a very nice GitHub, and I looked at the requirements section, right? What do we need to switch to Raylib? And they said, we support Linux. Great. And we even support Wayland. And I was like, I have Wayland. Can I have Raylib? No, no, you can't. OK? Because again, remember, you have Wayland, Western, WL shell. And of course, it broke at the WL shell, because nobody knows about this weird 2000, the thing that was deprecated in 2015, you know, that nobody used. So it, it was broken. But this whole experience gave us the opportunity to actually learn about the graphics stack and move to something simpler. And I will show you our new stack that we call the magic stack. We tried to choose a very simple word, you know, not an acronym. It's very simple, just magic. And it's much simpler. And this is our new stack. It basically replaced Qt with Raylib and Wayland with magic, which is a special piece of code that we wrote. And when I say this is simpler, I'm not saying like the idea is simpler. No, no. Like, Wayland, so Western, is more than 250,000 lines of code, right? Magic is 200 lines of C and 60 lines of Python, which is a thousand times smaller. And I'm sure most people would say that sometimes a thousand times smaller is kind of a thousand times simpler, right? So this is much simpler stack. And I know some people will look at this, right, and say stuff like, well, why did you change? It was working. What's the point? You just chase simplicity for, the, chase, uh, for the, the sake of simplicity, right? But the expression is like, don't kill your horse if it's still alive, or whatever it is. Uh, but we change for a reason like this, OK? This is the model execution time, so the actual time it takes for the model to run on your GPU, on your device. And as you can see, this is our new stack. And this is in green, it's the old stack. And the further on the left, the better. It means it runs faster, because the UI and the driving model has to fight for the resource of the GPU. So you want uh, the model to have all the time, so it doesn't conflict with OpenGL uh, you know, shaders or whatever. And we did this. And when I first plotted this, I was expecting the inverse. I was trying to see how bad of a job I did with this rewrite. But turns out, if you choose simplicity, you get stuff like this. And I love this plot so much, because it's such a representation of what comma is. You know, Raylib is written in Python by one guy in Spain, right? Qt is like a 900 people company. You know, you cannot get cloned, get uh, Qt. Uh, if you go on the subreddit of Qt, it's all people bitching about like licensing fee, etc. So, very complicated. 
And did you know that Python is 500 times slower than C++? You know, I didn't know that either, but you know, turns out if you choose simplicity, you win. And this is the part of this talk where it's super cool because it will go full circle. With this new simplicity, we can actually get new requirements, new tests. And I will finish on this. There's two new requirements we want to do with this new simplicity. The first one is we want to move the UI off from the GPU. We want to do software rendering. So the driving model has all the time for, you know, do its stuff, drive for you guys. So this plot will look even better. And to do this, like, you, you kind of want to use, like, the, and, and the software rendering implementation. So if you want to do the, the Mesa LVM pipe thingy to do that, well, you need to change what you use. And with the old stack, it's pretty hard because who even knows where the OpenGL context is just created, you know? So now we can do stuff like this, and we will do this very, very soon for you. The second thing we want to do, we want to add a streak mode to the UI, where if you start the UI with streak equals one, and the UI drops a single frame, the UI get killed instantly. And this is very nice because it would lead to a perfect UI, which never lags, essentially. And to do this in the old stack, again, you know, what does it even mean to drop a frame? Where does it drop a frame? You know, is it, is it in libgbm? Is it in, in Raylib? Is it in Western? Spoiler, it's always in Western. That's why I put a big box around Western so all the Western stuff stays in there. Never open that box, please. Uh, but yeah, now we can do stuff like this. We can know when you drop a frame because every time we render, we get the vblank ID of the screen itself. And if the, you know, the vblank, the diff is not one when you render, you technically drop a frame because you missed the opportunity to render a frame. The screen was ready, but you were not. And now I will leave Shane to go on stage and talk to you more about simple stuff again. <laughs>